I think that's, that's working. Um, is evaluatively labeled corruption. But if we look for more neutral labels, such as clientelism, or ethnic politics, or maybe machine politics, these are overlapping labels that are both positive and normative that we've talked about a little bit, and which people discuss a lot in cases like these. <coughs> And I mention this because neither of the two paper proposals of two pages really related these things to bigger, broader issues. And that's what I'm, and, and, but this is, and, and if you don't see this, you two people who are thoughtful, you're, I mean, you're all smart. If you're here, you're smart. I mean, you're, you're doing creative stuff. But you haven't made the connections. And so one thing which we're trying to do for everybody in this class is to give you some themes that you can use in, you know, what, wherever you're going in the years to come, when you come up with a new topic, maybe transit problems, etc., and then to try to relate them to some core concepts, maybe, you know, to 20, 20 or so, 20, 30 core concepts that we're discussing through, through the course. Okay, so a normative label is corruption. Uh, another example that I mentioned in China, just have one more country, one, one, more, one more example that, that you've heard here. What's the striking dog food example I mentioned from China? Anybody remember that? Who can, who can tell us, so you can talk to your family at Thanksgiving when they say how bad things are here in Des Moines. Okay. What's the story about American dogs that were, that didn't make, that, that were killed? Pretty sure I told the story. Yeah, there was a, there was a, there were China where there was a, was a company in China exporting dog food to the U.S. for for U.S. dogs. It was an inspector for the from the government in China responsible for inspecting the dog food and certifying that it was that it was okay to be exported. He got a cash contribution saying, "This dog food is okay, isn't it? Here's some money for you." He took the money. He said he said okay. The, the dog food was exported, hundreds or maybe thousands of U.S. dogs died. What did the national Chinese government do about the inspector? They hung him as an example of how serious the commitment is by the national government in China today to fighting corruption. They're all across China, there are many, many commissions fighting corruption. All across the European Union, especially in Southern Europe, where this is classic, most of the world, the main procedures for making policy decisions for hundreds of years has been clientelism. You do things because someone gives you a reward, either cash or ethnic solidarity or friendship or something which may be illegal, which may be Maybe the majority of people will say, no, don't do that, but there's a strong, active minority of a few who say, yes, do it, uh, and, you know, and I'll take care of you, or you won't be killed, or, or, or something like that. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, how to make sense of this? I mean, there's, there's a, the, there's a mo the most active literature on this is called clientelism, and I've been at you know, a dozen sessions of the, of the American and International Political Science Associations. Uh, I've, I've taught at places, I mean, I've taught in Italy, for instance. I mean, the classic places where this has been written about are Italy and Ireland. Okay, in Italy, I was, I was teaching at the University of Florence. They elected a physicist, professor at the University of Florence, as mayor of Florence. And he said, I will end this clientelism. We don't want parties involved. We want reform. So I talked to the political science and sociology college. They're in the same department at the University of Florence. It's the top place, top place in Italy for studying local government and so forth. They were, these are sensitive, you know, well-informed people. And I said, what, what do you make of the new mayor here in Florence? Oh, he's an amateur. You know, we don't pay any attention to him. I said, but does, it, does this imply there may be change going on in Italian local government or Italian government politics? No, 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 no. He, he doesn't understand politics, real politics. What did they mean by real politics? Clientelism. Okay. 
So even these smart political scientists and sociologists just you know, assume the world is clientelist. And if someone is trying to change it, they're naive. Okay, <laughs> uh, there was another woman, just one more example, uh, who did a PhD at the University of Bologna in Northern Italy. Uh, <coughs> and she, she, she wanted to study the most visible, dramatic case of clientelism in Italy, which is the city of Naples. So her PhD studied it for several years in, at a time period when there was a newly elected mayor. He was a former member of the Communist Party, very tough guy, Borsellino, sort of like the hat, and, and uh, uh, he, he applied sort of tough, tough tactics to fighting the opposition and to fight the people around him. And who were the most, some of the most visible people challenging, that is, trying to maintain the traditional system in Naples? One guess. The mafia. The ma and so the two visible things which everybody knew in Naples that the mafia controlled were the, sell the sale of cigarettes, tobacco. They were selling cigarettes at cheaper prices than in the shops because you had to pay a high tax. So the mafia sold them below that price and they made a lot of money doing that. Second, the, the largest public square in the middle of Naples had hundreds and hundreds of, of, of people parking there. It was illegal to park in the whole public square. It was supposed to be a piazza where you could walk across the square, <coughs> enjoy the view, and so forth. And it was filled with cars paying parking fees to the mafia. So the mayor took these two areas, cigarette sales and parking, and said, we will stop the mafia's control of these city, these are legitimate city government practices. Stop and we will, and henceforth, it's not going to happen. And he won. Okay, so taking two specific policy areas, fighting and showing he could change it, he then leveraged, and he did this again and again and again, and he, he basically challenged and succeeded, and in, in within the city of Naples, tried to build a, a sense of consent, not, I shouldn't say consensus, of citizen engagement, such as schools, like a fourth grade school in one, in, one, one, in one city school would adopt a shrine which had been closed for 50 years because it was too expensive and they didn't have enough visitors. So they would take a shrine like this, clean it all up, and then have students in the school volunteer to show visitors the shrine because it was part of their history and, and, and neighborhood culture. Okay, so things like that they, 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 they did to try to engage average citizens in ways that look a little bit like Tuckville or New England, but it's the opposite of the traditional view that the mafia controls everything, don't get in their way, it's dangerous, and um, don't participate maybe. Okay, so the point is this is happening, these, that is the tradition is clientelism around much of the world. The challenges are happening right now. And they have increased dramatically since, we put a one date on the board, I put on more than once. It is, if I can find a piece of chalk. Who can tell us what the date is? I can't find any chalk. 1989, why? What's the, what's the symbol of, here's, here's some right here. Oh, down here, too hidden. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay, <laughs> nice much. 1989, okay, what happened in 1989? The Berlin Wall went down. The, the self-declared, self you know, end, end of the traditional USSR. Tiananmen Square, I think was 1989. Uh, and this built on, in turn, sorry. <laughs> 1968, which was the student participation revolts uh, around the world and unions. So unions were sort of fighting for, for, for recognition and so forth, municipal government unions and so forth, and Vietnam War, those, those are three, three, three things going on. Okay, so point is, these were big challenges to the rules of the game. Uh, <coughs> the, um, uh, the point is, uh, 
the rules of the game are changing. What are, what are, what's another rule, name for the rules of the game? Political culture. That's what Vildovsky's writing about and what I'm talking about today in a, in a couple of different ways. So, so with, these, with these as, or say, what's just one more example since a US national politics. The US Constitution does not say that the president cannot hire his own family to work in the White House and that, and that he do, it doesn't say that he has to resign from the boards or sell all of the stock in his business holdings. But the normal, quote, political culture of the US high-level elected officials is you resign, you don't do that. Okay, so Trump, President Trump is challenging that rule of the game, which is unwritten, as is the whole, that is, there's no, for instance, there's no English constitution. Remember, we talked about Schumpeter studied that. How does parliament work? Point is, there is no constitution. It's not like the, like the, the Roman law or the French, the French penal code, whatever. It's more, you've got to look for it in unwritten places, but it's nevertheless very powerfully at work. Okay, so the point for you is to look for these when they seem to be, there seem to be something making things work in a different way in, in, the, in, the, in the location of transit stops and transit lines in Chicago, in the, in the large construction projects which have been stymied in Mumbai, and, and more. Okay, so if that's, our, if that's sort of the question about where and how does political culture work, um, actually, we, um, do, 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 yeah, can, can you walk, I mean, you've been walking around, can you walk around just leave, leave your camera for a little bit? Yeah. Could, could you see if this, if this thing will, will actually, what, what if we wait t t 10 or 15 minutes, but what we would like to play the DVD or the CD on this player. So if you want, if you want to look at it for a little, a little bit yeah. first, you know, or, or see, if, see, if it, see if it seems to be working great. Um, <coughs> uh, if it doesn't, we'll, we'll, we'll get along. Okay, so let's look at a couple of big concepts in here and um, the idea of political culture really came in in the 19th century, but it, at, the, at the beginnings it was usually discussed as part of a national. That is, the English do it this way, the Germans do it that way, the Italians do it that way. It's part of their national identity. The Chinese, it's part of their national political culture. Okay. Um, such as the monarchy and the national bureaucracy in France, the aristocratic institutions that I've talked about, like the French Academy, the university, the army, um, and how important literature and the arts were in France, more so than in England, where you had the court playing a less important, a less, um, played a different role, that is the, the court did not play a political or economic role so actively in, in, on the continent in general, in, in, in Versailles in particular, because power was much more traditionally hierarchically organized in an a, 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 a autocratic manner than in England. So the, and the coffee houses continued this. They, or they, let's say, let me use the word cafes, the French word was to continue style, elegance, conversation, in a way that was very different, uh, with more female-dominated, more court-like, flirtatious, aesthetics. By contrast, in England, the coffee houses were usually men alone. They started with wagers, throwing darts, having drinks <coughs> along with coffee. But then they would sort of make bets. Will your ship come in or not? I'll bet you this to that, that it won't. That led to insurance companies. That led to the stock market growing out of these coffee houses. Politically, this led to the traps, John Locke, Hobbes, and so forth. Contract theory grew out, grew out of discussions in coffee houses because these were actively, actively politically engaged. And Habermas <coughs> stresses this very much in his, in his, in his, uh, his main book. So these are not 
st standard law. So, Alex, you're a student in what program? Uh, law letters and society. Okay. Are you trying through courses like this to enrich the law so you locate it in the context of letters and society? And that, that's the beauty of that major for those of you, even if you're not majoring in it. If you think about, instead of the law says X, do they follow the law or not? That's too simple. The question is why do people follow the law? How do they change it? How did the inspector in, you know, in China not follow the law and why not? So, okay, so, <clears throat> so what, what, we're, what we're getting at is what's called sometimes informal law or, or the, the political culture is what underlies and legitimates some laws and other laws that says ignore them. I mean, the Chicago police have a, have a budget constraint, plus there are other things going on. But if you may have noticed, people drive about 20 miles an hour faster than the legal speed limit on Lakeshore Drive and many other places in Chicago. Five years ago, that was not true. The police were there. I mean, they were there with radar all the time. Okay. The political culture of how fast you can drive is, has changed. All right. Uh, <coughs> okay. Um, so... Examples, um, let, me give, let me give you one big example, Lynn, which begins to, get, we think this may work? Yeah, I think we've got it. Okay, okay so I'll, 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 I'll move into this. In, in France, they had, with Versailles, with the king, before 1789, they had a, a uh, hierarchical political system that came from Roman law, that is the the, the, the sense of the law says you must do this was, was, was quite clear and explicit. And, they, and, the, and who was the king was clear. By contrast, in Germany, they had multiple principalities, duchies, and so forth. You had Prussia, Bavaria as big, play, big, big, big regions, but then you had lots of little ones. And they had different legal institutions, different traditions. And so what did it mean to be German? And who defined that? The culture and the intellectuals, the cultural intellectuals who were articulate, Goethe, Wagner, Nietzsche, these, these were the leaders in saying the German nation, the German people, are this, A, B, C, D, E. It was not the elected officials. It was not the law. So the law may have then been changed, and the big change was when Bismarck became head of the German state and tried to build a modern state, into, and, and he built on these kinds of, kinds of institutions. Uh, that, that is, not these former institutions, but more the sense of culture. Okay, so how can we capture, how can we capture this kind of stuff? Um, the person who wrote about this most forcefully, probably in much of the 19th century, in France it was Stendhal, but in, 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 in Italy it was Rossini, in the book by Stendhal, <coughs> called you know, The Life of Rossini. Uh, but in terms of Germany, Wagner wrote four volumes before he wrote his major work called The Ring. And, and he said things like this. This is it does not just a bad translation, this is the way he wrote it wrote, tragedy was therefore the entry of the artwork of the folk upon the political arena of political life. Artwork was how, he's saying, artwork was how the people got to politics. That's what I just said. And we may take its appearance as an excellent touchstone for the difference in procedure between the art creating of the folk and the mere literary historic, historical making of the so-called cultured art world. So he, the, let me read on. Tragedy flourished for so long as it was inspired by the spirit of the folk, as in the spirit was, as this spirit was a veritable popular, that is a communal one, where the national brotherhood of the folk was shivered, when the national brotherhood of the folk was shivered into fragments when the common bond of its religion and primeval customs was pierced and severed by the sophist needles of the egotistic spirit of Athenian self-dissection, 
Then the folk's artwork also ceased. Then did the professors and the doctors of the literary guilds take heritage from the ruins of the fall of fallen edifice. Okay, so um, Wagner then wrote four volumes about how this should all come together. That is how the arts and culture can give you a national political identity when the legal institutions are not there. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's give it a try. See if we can, see if we can get this. We, we usually have to turn the volume up pretty high after you start. Uh, no, no, wait, it, there's no screen. It's, it's, ju it's just audio. Oh, okay. Musical compositions bearing des Nibelungen is by far the largest. A consecutive performance of its four separate parts would last for some 15 hours. To confer unity on this vast scheme, Wagner built his score out of a number of recurrent themes, each one associated with some element in the drama and developed in conjunction with the These are tools for you to take away from this course. These themes, or leading motives as they've come to be called, are not mere identification tags nor is the score a simple patchwork made up by introducing each motive at the appropriate point in the stage action. Wagner's own description of his themes was melodic moments of feeling, and writing about his intentions beforehand, he said, these melodic moments will be made by the orchestra into a kind of emotional guide throughout the labyrinthine structure of the drama. Wagner's motives have, in reality, a fundamentally psychological significance and his score is a continuous symphonic development of them, reflecting the continuous psychological development of the stage action. In consequence, a comprehensive analysis of the ring would be an enormous task. It would involve clarifying the He destroyed the, the classical symphony. The he destroyed Mozart, Beethoven, Bach by doing this. Long and complex development. This is anti-them. Understanding and enjoyment of the work can be greatly helped by simply establishing the identity of all the really important motives and indicating what immediate dramatic symbols they stand for, which is all that this introduction is intended to do. The motives are associated with four different types of dramatic symbol, characters, objects, events, and emotions. An example of a motive representing a character is the stern fanfare which introduces Hunding in Act One of Die Valkyrie. <laughs> An example of a motive representing an object is the genial theme associated with Friar's golden apples. This is introduced in scene two of Das Rheingold. It's sung by Fafner as he explains the value of the apples to Fasolt. <laughs> Too, if you want. An example of a representing an event is the brief agitated figure on the woodwind which follows Alberic's threat of violence against the Rhine maidens in scene one of Rheingold. <laughs> An example of a motive representing an emotion is the furious
is that fundamental element in music, the major chord. This chord, spread out melodically as a rising major arpeggio by the horns, forms the mysterious nature motive which opens the whole work. soon undergoes a simple melodic transformation into a peacefully undulating string theme, and the result is what may be called the definitive form of the nature motive, since this is the form in which it will recur throughout the whole work. has these going along scene by scene, action by action, but there is not, as you have with Beethoven, four parts, fast, slow, fast, and so forth. It, he destroyed the classical symphony. He destroyed the classical opera from Italy. And, and after Wagner, music has never, has, has never been the same since. People talk about post-Wagnerian aesthetics of doing this or doing that and so forth. <coughs> um, but behind, behind that was this kind of philosophy, in a sense, uh, this kind of, and these elements got articulated 30, 50 plus years later by Max Weber, by Emil Durkheim, and talking about the folk as basic values or preferences or political culture. Okay, so we're, we're building on this, and if you, if you read closely in the book called Scenescapes, we have a page and a half or so on Wagner, and I think in chapter two, and we then talk how this talk about how this gets to Claude Levi Strauss. So Levi Strauss, probably the greatest anthropologist who ever, ever lived, uh, said at the beginning of his of his four major volumes on myth, my main inspiration is Wagner. Uh, Wagner is also very politically incorrect. He was, he, he got, he was used, he wrote the 19th century, he got used in the mid 20th century, anti-Semitic, etc. cetera. The, the uh, if you go to the auditorium theater in downtown Chicago, you see his face is up there, and down the, down the side you see names, Beethoven, Shakespeare, and so forth. Wagner's name has been eliminated. In the state of Israel, Daniel Barenboim was invited to perform at an official ceremony and said, I'd, I'd like to, but I'd like to perform Wagner. And they said, oh no, you can't play Wagner in Israel. So he, he, they said, what? He said, well, all right, I'll play something else. So they said, will, will you please come? He performed, and what did he play? Wagner, okay. So the musicians like Barenboim are saying, this is too important to simply cut out or try to cut out of our cultural background, it's there. And I'm making the point, it's, it's not just the narrow musical background, it's part of more general political culture <coughs> in ways that, that we should openly address frankly and, and recognize the, that Wagner himself was a very nasty person in many ways, etc. I won't go into all of that, but these, these ideas are too important and if they're being used by Levi Strauss and Baron Borm, who have pretty impeccable ethnic credentials in this, in this respect, they're making arguments that the idea should be used. Okay. Um, <coughs> the, uh, just one or two other quick points on this that were not mentioned by, that the speaker there was Derek Cook, who is the leading English interpreter of, uh, of Wagner, <laughs> and uh, he didn't mention this 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 term, Gesamt, G-E-S-A-M-P-T, Gesamt uh, Kunst, 
So this is entire Kunst is art. There is work. So the idea is there's an, a holistic integrated artwork, which Wagner said we need, if we can do this, we will have more emotional power. And it should be music, it should be theater, theatrical, it should be staging, you know, people who are actors, singers, dancers, whatever, costumes, uh, but, but it, should, it should also be um, the whole thing in integrated and the only way to do that properly is for one person to write the whole thing, which he then did. In, so in his ring and most of his work, he wrote the score, he wrote the music, he wrote these books to, to talk to the, to the directors, to the singers, to the performers, to the conductors. How do you do this and, and, and put, it, put it all together so it has an integrated emotional whole is, the, is what was the key idea. You all know about this stuff because you've seen it in Hollywood. Hollywood's been doing this for the whole 20th century, but they, they took it over. And so you have things even for sale in how they had books from Germany, then they had them in Hollywood. You can now look up on the web and say, you know, I'd like to have this kind of theme. I'd like to have this kind of musical aura for this kind of character. I want to play as background in my Hollywood movie, how to do it. And so this is now, that, that is the same ideas that you heard in Derek Cook's introduction are there. That is, Hollywood directors will say, yes, we want music. I mean, they used to have what, what we used to call silent movies. And in the days of silent movies, you might have someone playing an organ or a, you know, a, you know, a violin during the film. But when you then had in the 1930s, sound joined with the movies, then this took off. You know, how can we put this together? As well as, of course, television. Television advertising uses these ideas all the time. So, so in that, you know, you hear a sound, a song, a melody, which says, you know, buy, buy this kind of shoes, buy this kind of hamburger, etc., and so forth. So, music and, and the and the the effort in, and that the reason people do this is they think it works. The advertising firms say emotions will engage you with something which is good and they'll buy that kind of soap or hamburger or car or whatever. All right. <coughs> so um, I have a question over. Yeah, question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so in terms of the relationship between politics and music history and art history, um, is it romanticism one of the only periods in which like the political ideology really like strongly from that because it seems more frequently that it goes in the other direction that it's a response to the politics that you know generates these artistic behaviors but that doesn't seem to be the case here with like Goethe, Wagner, etc. No, no, for sure. I mean, uh, I mean, it, 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 could, it could go either way. I'm, I'm, my my point is simply that 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 in talking about political culture, people use it to support, to try to legitimate, as well as to attack the legitimacy of who's there. So when Donald Trump, people, the, the press had a lot of stuff on who will, what musical bands will perform at the inaugurational ceremony of Donald Trump? And what did lots, what did lots, probably most bands in the U.S. say? No way, I'm not going to perform it in on the White House. I don't like that, as, you know, call him all, all kinds of names. So, yes, for sure. Can uh, I add? Yeah, sure. This? Just um, to emphasize what's already been said, um, part of the reason that Wagner is still contested in Israel today and the performance of it is because the political scene that was created by the music, um, it took on another life during the Holocaust. So that it actually became part of the scene of um, the uh, concentration camp. So that Hitler actually blasted the music from Wagner's uh, ring cycle uh, as he was executing people. So survivors of the Holocaust still remember this really, really distinctly because it's part of a political scene. Um, and Wagner's niece, I believe, was a political advisor to Hitler as well. So this music it became literal political theater 
uh, not just in the context of the opera, but also was added specifically to a scene that still continues to traumatize survivors today. Sophie did her BA and MA on Walt Disney, and she taught me that in the 1930s, Walt Disney voted <coughs> for Oh, he was a Nazi, and he also... Voted for the American Nazi Party in the yes. 1930s. Friendly, Chicago, I guess it was Waukegan. Uh, and he drew heavily from Wagner as well in all of his. Okay. Okay. <coughs> all right, so deconstructing these things and being more aware of them as she, as she has done and showing how... The Lion King has elements of racism, and, and the lion is different from the, the zebra, is different from the giraffe, and they have different voices and different ethnic overtones that are recognizable today in the U.S. is what we're, is another way of framing what, what, what I'm talking about now, so thank you. <coughs> um, uh, What were nations abroad when people came to Argentina or the US or Australia or Canada were ethnic groups and ethnic politics, especially in US cities. Even if people don't like to apply the label of themselves, like the lady in New York was interviewed, Madam, are, are ethnic considerations important in your choice of a political candidate? She replied, Ethnic schmethnic, what counts is whether or not he's Jewish. Okay, so ethnics is, is what other people do. But how, how make sense of these cultural currents? They were long overwhelmed by a moralistic sense of essentially Anglo-Saxon elitism. The public schools in Massachusetts, opened in the 1930s, had a critical mission of Americanization of immigrants. But as the numbers of immigrants swelled in places like Boston and New York, and as the immigrants had the right to vote, the possibilities for recruiting new supporters was quickly seized upon by, by political organizers. The New York Tammany Hall Democratic Party club members used to meet each other, used to meet each boat of immigrants and help each person find lodging, food, and if needing, needed, a job. These immigrants were grateful for the help they received and often were, were visited periodically by a precinct captain or similar party worker to remind them, for example, not to forget to vote. And by 1880, the net result was, was that these new immigrants elected other immigrants as mayors, council members, who became a majority in New York, Boston, New Haven, and other places, as you noted in Dolls Who Governs. The ex plebes he discussed them, were not a very elevated label, but if you look more closely, his leaders were, from what ethnic group? Irish. That was those were the main ex plebes at the beginning. And then Italians were especially numerous in New Haven, Boston, and many of the New England towns. <coughs> Dahl doesn't make so much of it, but they were often resented in other cities. And while most of the old Yankees, as Tuckville discussed, simply abandoned politics for other businesses, the professions, and other pursuits, this was also the period when many. Um, Private schools were created in small towns in New England where proper children were sent to avoid the corruption and the new, these new ethnic influences in places like New York or uh, other, other, other locations. Gabriel Almond did his PhD here on how the Yankees fought the new immigrants in New York by developing a set of civic institutions outside the city government that did studies, proposed policies, and served as general watchdogs and lobbying groups to help exert pressures on the newly elected immigrants. The New York Times continues this tradition as, as, do, as, do, as do many of the media and every day, only it provides surveillance over every government in the country, not just, not just New York, uh, <coughs> CNN, uh, etc. The crusading newspaper, publishing scandals in order to sell newspapers and control politicians is an old US tradition. Again, starting as you pointed out from opposing politics and using music or scandal or 
style, photographs. It's largely a Protestant and a Jewish tradition which depends on a sense of moral outrage. The reader must want to, to shake his fist and head and say, throw the bums out. You don't find this function of the press by contrast traditionally in continental Europe where the press was assumed to be a merely a partisan extension of a political party or a church or a labor union like Michel's Democratic, uh, Democratic Party. More on this in the uh, American journalism. Along with the press were public speakers who traveled across the US criticizing the immigrant style of politics and calling for a new political program that would keep government honest. Um, I'll skip the names, but this was the core of what was called the progressive movement led by Teddy Roosevelt about 1905 to 1915. Uh, okay. People at the time spoke of, of machine versus reform. So, the, so if we get to city politics and some legal institutions that were created in those years, <coughs> Um, we had the city manager at large elections. Um, that is, what's an at large election, somebody? Some legal, some pre law student. Alex, what's an at large election? I don't know. <laughs> okay, you can vote for, for 50 city council members in each of 50 wards, which are constituency elections. By contrast, you can have, you could elect 50 aldermen from the city of Chicago at large where all of the voters in every neighborhood would all vote for 50. And there would be no ward specific representative. LA long had predominantly war at large elections. Uh, and so, they, and it fits with the, Calif California as a state was created at the time of Teddy Roosevelt and political reform so that partisanship was outlawed in local elections which were called nonpartisan in that required for all local governments in California. No party labels because they were seen as continuing this kind of ethnic solidarity in, and, 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 it, and the at large idea was that you would not have people, you would consciously try to Americanize, to integrate everybody rather than preserving a neighborhood specific ethnic solidarity. Okay, so by contrast, the machines, traditional organizations would have a mayor <coughs> as a chief, a chief official, not a city manager, and would have ward, ward elections rather than at, at large, where there would be partisan, partisan party labels included rather than Nonpartisan, nonpartisan, no party on the way, and and the key driver was the institution of not not a legal institution, but a an informal institution of patronage uh, versus um, we can call this re re reform <coughs> or anti patronage is the classic kind of kind of label. Um, Okay, these were the concepts introduced in the late 19th century, and the good citizens, that is the more elite Protestants, were on the side of reform. Even this ivory tower in the Midwest took a strong position. The sociology department did studies of migration, and immigrants were seen as progressively moving up into culture. The model for this process was called human ecology. It modeled the masses of immigrants using the same concepts for plants, and animals in a jungle, environment, competition, survival of the fittest, the Burgess Zone Theory, parks, students, monographs, conceived of immigrants as only gradually becoming part of America, invasion, succession were concepts which you still find today in many urban textbooks. There was no culture and no politics, explicitly in human ecology. Initially, perhaps, uh, implicitly, these hordes of immigrants, since these hordes of immigrants were seen as subhuman, uncultured, but the non-recognition was not an accident. It was, an, it was a reflection of American values at the time that the Statue of Liberty welcomed all, but once here, immigrants should become American. There were occasional efforts by, by immigrants to maintain 
cultural associations, especially Germans before World War I who founded Goethe societies, but after the beginning of World War I, they were called in Chicago, Goethe Street. He's an immigrant like anybody else, no fancy pronunciation. Goethe is the name up there, okay. Um, first churches, social workers, the Rockefeller Foundation supported the, in the 1920s, the Social Science Research Council to conduct studies. Then political scientists like Charles Merriam who organized national conferences of local officials in the 1920s 30s and taught special courses for them. With foundation support, the Midway right here became the national center for the reform movement in the entire United States. <coughs> Many of those institutions have gone, but the center is the same building as there is 1313 East 60th Street. And they, had, they used to have in the building about 25, let's say, I shouldn't say 25, maybe 10, 10 leading national organizations and others that weren't so well known, plus a big library, which was the best library in the country for local government, and they had a consulting service called the Public Administration Service, where lots of grad students and faculty would work, and they'd go out and work with, work with local governments around the country, Not, and including stellar people like Herbert Simon, the founder of organizational sociology, organizational analysis, James March was his was collaborator student, William F. Ogburn, Philip Hauser, Sam Stauffer, uh, and, and, and so forth. Uh, <coughs> I mention these names in this intellectual activity to give this a sense of its scope and seriousness at the time, but the main point is to illustrate that this took place within a distinct conception of political culture. Almost none of them at the time thought in these terms. They talked of good and bad, left and right, conservative and liberal. They didn't say political culture, which sort of says maybe the other guy should have a perspective that we recognize as well. It's a, it, the, the label political culture comes more, or culture comes more from sociology and anthropology, which says, look at the rules of the game and maybe everybody has a right to some, some rules. The way I'm sort of putting it up here rather than just saying it's good and bad. Uh, <coughs> After the war, a student came to Chicago from a Connecticut farm background to study political science. He worked part-time in, part in the planning department downtown at the city, city of Chicago and eventually wrote his PhD about how the city planned or in fact did not plan. His name was Edward Banfield. He was on the faculty here through the 50s and 60s and wrote several books on Chicago, then with his student James Q. Wilson, City Politics based on 1963 on case studies of cities across the U.S. by their students. They, they formulated an approach to political culture that shocked most of their colleagues, most good Hyde Parkers, and since they'd read some Max Weber, they worked they worked a bit with Edward Schills and following these examples, an important work by the Columbia historian Richard Hofstetter, they argued there were two distinct political cultures that included these, but bigger. There were bigger themes that, that, that encompassed and, and, and de from which these were derived. So these are the legal specifics for the most part. <coughs> they talked about the, the public regarding and the private, sorry, sorry, public, I'll just put this up here on top, public and private regarding. Uh, and that these in turn, I'll, I'll add, just add a few more dimensions, were conceptions of good government, reform, and so forth as taught at 1313. These were supported in turn, and this became controversial, by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, Scandinavians, and Jews more upper status, more educated, whereas these were more traditionally Catholic, especially Irish. Uh, <coughs> East European, Southern Europeans, usually less, less educated. <coughs> what this also did was to undermine the absolutism of good and bad by relativizing it all. They essentially introduced cultural relativism, applied it to themselves, their professional associates, and politics. And maybe they said, the machine is not so bad. It emerges from an ethnic that can be defended 
And James Q. Wilson did a book called Negro Politics and another on the amateur politician where he sought to show that black politics and reform politics each had its own distinct political cultures. Um, when they, they both went to Harvard uh, a decade or so later, and they, especially in Cambridge, they had huge conflicts with people in Boston, people on the faculty, Boston journalists, et cetera. Who's who's, who's taking the getting the hearing this idea of you know maybe Daly in Chicago is not just a bad person? How can you say that? Similarly, you had Irish in Boston, uh, and you had strong Irish politics. The classic example was when the British recruiter came to the mayor of Boston in 19 during World War One around 1915, 14, 15, said mayor. We'd, we'd like to have permission for the British Army to recruit here in the city of Boston to fight the, the First World War. Will you, will, will you permit this, permit us to do this? And then what did the mayor say? The Irish mayor said, take him, take every last one of them you can get. Okay. That's the title of a book on certain kinds of ethnic politics by Edward, sorry, paper, Edward Glazer on, on uh, uh, how some politics was fought in Boston. Okay, <coughs> um, not just Boston. Uh, Daniel Elazar, we've mentioned before, was a student in Chicago in these years. He was, he was st studying these same things and he came up with theories that were very close, somewhat independent, somewhat overlapping with Elazar and, Ban and um, uh, sorry, with, with, with Banfield and Wilson. He added a couple of important things. That is, he added more subtlety about New England. Oh, sorry, New, the New England moral background is generating this and, and linking this in turn to Max Weber's writings on, Cal on Calvinism and the specifics of Calvinist theology and background, moral righteousness, honesty, uh, and so forth. Women as carriers deserve special treatment. Um, in the League of Women Voters, et cetera. Um, following Wagner, we, we some, or sometimes, if we were, we're yeah, how many, yeah, I think we, we don't, all right. We don't have so many foreign students here, so maybe we, we, don't, we don't have to do it. But, but in, in other times, let's, let's just have a line or two. I would ask the Americans in the class to sing for us, please, the battle hymn of the Republic, and then we could talk about the words. Can we can we get the first line or two of the battle hymn of the Republic? Okay. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He has. Okay. <laughs> All right. I don't hear you resounding in song, but I don't know it. <laughs> okay, but thinking of Wagner. When, for instance, right after 9-11, I was bicycling in West Chicago, sort of out, you know, out in the country, past the suburbs. Suddenly we came across, there's a little church, you know, you, walk, you bike for two miles, there's nothing except farm fields, there's a little church. This was a day or two after 9-11. What did you hear in the church? Mine eyes have seen the glory. Okay. The, the, the Battle Hymn of the Republic is a classic song joining the moralism of right and wrong from the Bible with politics. And it was, it was used earlier as an, as an abolitionist song, John Brown's Body Lies a Moldering in the Grave. Because then it was taken over in the 1860s for, by the Yankee troops to fight the South in what they call South of the, we had a couple of you from the South. What do they call this war in the South? War of aggression. The war of what? Northern aggression. The war of northern aggression is what it is still called in the South today. Okay. <clears throat> All right. The battle hymn of the Republic, and then when Abraham Lincoln met the the uh, the uh, uh, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, he at least a stent, he says he, we know we don't know for sure, but one story at least is he said, "So you are the little lady who started the Great War." Okay, the point is, these examples are pointing to novels, songs, music, 
like Wagner that engaged the emotions in favor of reform. And these were New Englanders who were doing this in the lead, but they were countered by, by, by aspects as well, which you don't hear so often, especially at this university or from the New York Times. Um, the South. Okay, so what Elazar added was bits on the South, which Banfield and Wilson had left out. So I'm gonna say just a word or two about the South, and then we have this discussion shortly. Link we'll this, link this term to turn to more. Okay, so the South. All right, how, how many of you have been to a Wagnerian performance? So, I mean, that's normal. Usually, no, okay, one. All right, so one in the entire, and you have a last name called Breslau. Okay, all right. I so watched your, the DVD. So, okay, watch the DVD, okay. All right, point is, you don't get this normally. How many of you have read a novel by William, by probably the greatest American novelist, William Faulkner? One, two, okay, three, okay, four. <coughs> um, these are critical for you students of public policy, political science, and law. These define the cultures of different regions and subgroups within the US and the tools that you get that, that have been applied by Derek Cook and others by Levi Strauss to analyze Wagnerian themes, you can also apply to political themes like Donald Trump's speeches on Twitter, speeches or and on television or his tweets on Twitter. And people, we're working with people not doing this. We have, there's six political science majors in the college now all, all going to law schools <laughs> We're working with me on a paper on Trump, and we're trying to do exactly this kind of thing. Okay, so this is not just, this is not a class on English literature. But contrast Faulkner's The Sound of the Fury. When the southern boy, Quentin Copson, goes to Harvard in his first year, he hates the abstract rationality. He crushes his own watch glass with his thumb he grinds his thumb into the watch glass until it bleeds because he hates this being imposed upon him. So the contrast between the time, the, the, the hands that are constraining him to, to, to be in class, which he, he does this when he's skipping the class. Uh, in reaction, hierarchy of respect for an older order, his family of Colonel Sartaris as the Civil War hero, the house and family blood lines that continue is critical. So concepts, lineage, the relative absence of civic groups, this is not New England, the collective and, and uh, instead duty, honor, leadership. The Snopes family took over via control of the country store from these older from the older family, the Copsons, and his own mother was a Snopes, his father was a Copson. So in the family, you have three children who were fighting, three brothers who were fighting over the honor of their sister and how it can, can be carried on in a proper way. Okay, if we want to link, link this then more explicitly, look at one of the leading political scientists of the mid 20th century, Ms. E.O. Key, did a PhD from here, taught at Harvard for many years. <coughs> Contrast the delta with the highlands of each of the southern states. Populist reaction against hierarchy in the politicians. Huey Long, Big Jim Folson in Alabama, and political speeches. Listen to the to Theodore Bil Bilbo. Um, In 1934, Bilbo brought into play his genius for rough and tumble campaigning. He wore from an earlier campaign a scar won in his oratorical battles for the people. He had been wrapped over the head with a pistol butt by an opponent whom he had described as a cross between a mongrel and a, a hyena and a mongrel, begotten in a nigger graveyard at midnight, suckled by a sow and educated by a fool. In the 1934 campaign, as in, as in other, others, Bilbo had earlier done a little Baptist preaching, salted his story with bastard King Jamesian aratundities, long familiar, I'm quoting from, from V.O. Key. <coughs> friends, 
fellow citizens, brothers and sisters, hallelujah. My opponents, yea, that at this opponent of mine who has the dastardly, dewlapid, brazen, sneering, insulting, and sinful effrontery to ask you for your votes without telling you, the people of Mississippi, what he's going to do with him if he gets them. This opponent of mine who says he doesn't need a platform. Okay. Etc. Okay, this is political science. It links. Okay. Um, the communicants of the faith of Bilbo shouted, Amen! Hallelujah! They roared at his little obscenities, and again by a narrow margin he won and became Senator of the United States from Mississippi. Okay. Um, the, the emotions are there. They've been, alas, even more ignored by many of the discipline within the discipline of political science since 1968 because of the rise of a sort of public choice, narrowly construed rationality or ra social, social realism or rationalism, which the more subtle economists are now studying in the form of amenities. The economists, even the smart economists, are doing this if the, the political scientists are doing bad, bad, bad economics when they leave this up. Um, okay, I can fill in more, but let me, let, let me, let me stop here for a little, little bit of discussion reactions to any of this is this is maybe not what you normally get in most of your social science courses. What's your, what's your reaction? Uh, well, actually, I had a question much uh, earlier in the uh, on stuff, like uh -huh. much earlier in the right. lecture. And anything's fair. Okay. Um, so, what I actually this had is supposed to be part of all one one integrated course, but we're trying to give you the, the pieces after we get you got the overall structure. Go ahead. Okay. So I had a question about like the um, mob and like the uh, the uh, uh, I the like how that worked versus um, uh, like the versus clientelist uh, clientelist. Stuff. So, the, from the, by the mob, you mean like well, so, uh, uh, like, like the mafia. You mean, yeah. Okay. Sure. Go ahead. So, uh, at least as uh, my familiarity with that is admittedly from like popular cultural sources, but one of the drivers of that uh, that like as a source of like uh, presence is. Uh, resorting to that as like a, a something more efficient than the legal system. So, for instance, like trying, uh, like it, uh, it, in terms of popular sources, maybe uh, going to the mafia for a favor that could get be paid later. Um, is that yes. is that also true of clientelists uh, in your uh, conception of it? Um, ge generally, yes. I mean, the, 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 the simple one simple way to, 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 to show uh, clientelism is to, and, and I, I, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't give you a summary, but, but here's, here's a one picture summary. That you have a, a political candidate who can give favors to political workers like precinct captains, uh, or, sorry, jobs classically jobs and contracts to the political workers. The political workers in turn give favors to the citizens and the citizens in turn give votes to the political candidates. That's the kind of classic triumvirate of, of, of clientelism in Ireland, in Italy, and, and, and Chicago traditionally. So you have, and notice this is materialistic non-ideological. There is no party program. So by contrast, you have a program, a party program, and a political candidate who in this, in this uh, A, and, A and B, in this kind of reform model would say, he stands for honesty, truth, and you know, bit, bitter, uh, higher taxes or lower taxes. That is public policies, not something 
which is goes to a private individual. So Jane Byrne, Jane Byrne had the, had a great phrase I quoted. You know, I you know every every Christmas I spend six hundred and eighty thousand because I love the people of Chicago. She sent Chris thousand dollars because I love my because Miss Chickens. She sent she sent material objects like that with no expectation of anything in return. Okay. All right. Yes. So and so of course the mob the, the mob the mafia would then add the either violence or the threat, the threat which in turn would lead to, we'll, get, we'll sell you protection because you want to be safe, don't you? And we'll keep your store safe if you'll just give us uh, $1,200 a year. But did, did, were the, the Southern Italians were not the only people in the world who did this. Think of you know, much of the world in past years, and much, much of the world still today is doing this. Other, other comments? <coughs> or Macbeth. All right, you're relatively quiet. Nobody wanted to sing but maybe you're reflecting on these issues, and I hope you'll continue to do so. <coughs> and if anybody wants to chat a little bit today, we'll have office hours starting right now. Thank you. Okay. Read some Faulkner and Wagner, and listen to Wagner, and, and Walt Disney if you want. <laughs> Send me the draft. Send me a question that is on a, a real question on the board. I'm going to help you. Uh, so, so okay. I've tried to answer in those terms rather than you know, change the Okay? So romanticism has a unique 19th century meaning, but it also has a more general meaning, which you can talk about. Or let's say, loose. Yeah, I was under the impression you got that. Anybody have something quick? Or you talking about that? I'd say general, I'd say for the two of you, generalize a little more. Sure, I'm pretty good. I'm going to say an example of what I talked about today. 
in part with the flu of you in mind and your specific papers that there's a lot of people. That is, this is not just one part, it's not just transit. Is it the same Monday or Wednesday? Okay. And so, and so you know, try to think about where and how and why it may look different in the new book. But um, I, had, I had a PhD student named Liza Weinstein. She went to Mumbai. Study the the the, 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 the huge yeah. area which was was uh, in the, this very popular film about uh, 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 the, the the slum the slums area right. in Norton and how the development developers were, were making money from it and trying to get sponsors and stuff. So she was studying to get a visa from I guess from the Indian government after about eight like months. She said, "Sorry, I'm not political. You've got to move." No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I can still manage to finish it. So, uh, and the film writes it all up and it's pretty good. So, yes, I mean, you've got corruption, fine tools, and you the same things. Even in what used to be, you know, Churchill's proper British. Yeah, Nehru, <laughs> you know, Gandhi, yeah. all this stuff. Right. I mean, they had so conceptions that, which were um, very much in What literature from the class actually? But I, I guess so, so yeah. a related thing yeah. might be this, yeah. Yeah. And then what are the battles within Indian political and subcultures which support and oppose and make them make this And what, what's changed since the time of I mean, in Churchill's biography, he says, for instance, Church, church, the, 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 after the English yeah, left, and research design, so methods and research and design, freedom, you know, independence. <laughs> yeah, sorry. The no, Indian, the <laughs> Indian <laughs> like go started I'm a survey like, in yeah, the yeah, yeah. to say so methods and research how much more do you feel is empowered and part of and a new, a new is, era because um, the British are no longer here as a dominating colonist. So I would want to interview and they, and, and they found people in the community for these sectors. We didn't know they were here. Whatever it is, so they stop the sure that the methods too, match your research too much bad, question. Bad, you know. So if you're like, how do people anyway, think about so this? You want th 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 think about so something like that. See if you can apply interact, apply some of these you do you know, conflicts and right, I mean, so so that is what's it in the in in India has so very articulate okay. writers yeah. and yeah. You know, activists so on these in terms of if you want to know how these kinds of you got because very active reform, that is, and so it came in part, that is, it, the, the English um, enhanced it, but it was but there before the interact, English. You gotta watch it, interact, and in Max right? Weber's um, book on the religion, you know, take it, so just to make sure that Weber's book called The Religion, there's a logic thing. for why you're doing just this particular kind of stuff. And that's a whole interpretation of the gurus. And normally you would the, have the an elites in the forest, and unlike and China, unlike England, whatever, they were um, defeated military that, leaders, and they political. went into the forest because, because they, they didn't want to fight anybody in the on horseback. So, and they like, this is what I developed a whole spiritual, um, you know, about so like moralistic politics class, continued by Nero yeah, yeah, and Gandhi. Exactly. Yeah, because I mean, and today, yeah, yeah. but I know what you mean. So they 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 so proposal. Where did Martin yeah. Luther King get his hypotheses? Why you like so based on the part of world politics? Why would you have these hypotheses? Right. And then what would be some alternate explanations? Like, what could I mean? You're guessing that this thing might happen, but what are some other possibilities and why? Okay, yeah. proposal. So I that's how you would write that change. Like I, okay. I said, I wrote like a lot yeah, of questions about. Sense. And if you I don't know if you remember that about. You could deal. Uh, so in that section of hypotheses, you guys people choose to put them in interviews and decide to do them. Local government, like yeah. Then you're gonna be like, so this person only seems to believe. And so I kind of shaped the question to you know, and that what makes wealthy citizens choose to donate to local leaders. Yeah, and so then like or local nonprofits. Like in the, uh, I'm just going to do a proposal because I don't think there's enough data out there. You know, literature. Okay. Just one paper possibility for anybody, including a BA, is if I had $5 million, dollars, here is a study I would do. You don't need to do bad, superficial, empirical work. Right, okay. But write out sharply and clearly if I had the money, here is how, here are the propositions I would formulate. Coming from these different yeah, 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 yeah. Here is here are the so ways like that I would test them and like and tell us that. Well, oh, I, pick, I picked two like cities. Right. I, I just didn't know. I didn't right. have it's a lot like of data on like zip codes, et cetera. And I didn't have any questions. But you should make sure with him for sure. I'd say start with the coherent theory and then 
but yeah. usually you can't you can't That's test a coherent theory in two like cities. I mean, I've been studying Chicago one city for okay. well, no, it's 40 years. Oh, yeah. It was just comparing two yeah. cities. You should in terms figure of out a, a like question, question, like an actual My point is, you can't do multi causal and analysis with, with that, an NF2. Um, in okay. Okay. Or, or even more than an NF1. I do case studies. And um, they're useful, a lot of students but like I'm simply my my simple point like is does, articulate the theory That's first, okay. right? And, and, and how make does that something happen? Okay. Yeah, right. okay. Right. Okay. okay. Interesting because there's like a lot of tell me your name just for oh uh, my name is Rachel. Yeah. Rachel, yeah. Rachel last name Weinberg. Right. So and it, like E I N B R E. Okay. Good. Look forward to it. Absolutely. So like a question that would be like how did people? I was just talking about like paper proposal. Sure. Abigail Brock. Okay. Um, right. um, yeah, and I, I think, I mean, I think these comments may all help. Obama Center all and so it's a good um, idea. You're always yeah, so I guess like the summary of it yeah. is that right. um, yeah. I'm interested yeah. in right. activist groups who have interviewed for my BA, like, but they pick a totally different topic, yeah. so I was right. going to take kind of the data and look at it in a different way. But they're like police abolitionist groups in Chicago that like are largely centered.